Thank you, Dr. Burston. That was a, a wonderful introduction to our day and really, I'd say, a perfect overview and outline of what we want to get into in more detail today uh, in, in our discussions of the key issues and questions. So thank you all for being here. Uh, before I begin, can we just have another round of applause for Dr. Burston? And can I also invite our, our reaction panel to come up to the stage? So thanks everyone for being here. Um, we're really, really pleased to have such a great attendance um, here at, this, at the um, forum today. My name is Keevney Klein and I serve as Senior Counsel uh, for Policy Issues uh, on our Government Relations team in, at Kaiser Permanente. As part of my role, uh, I have the privilege of working across our organization and externally on a variety of policy issues, um, national and state, um, including I have the privilege of working on our telehealth issues, uh, which I have very much enjoyed. I've been working on telehealth and related issues, as well as provider network related issues for about five years uh, at Kaiser Permanente. And I have to say, I'm pretty lucky to be in that space. Uh, I get to see a lot of the cool innovations that we are doing as an organization across the program, uh, including obviously the technology itself, but also how we're implementing it um, you know, day to day, as well as uh, in pilot stages as we're um, testing and proving new, um, new innovations and new applications. So we titled this forum, uh, Leveraging Telehealth to Expand Access to High Quality Care, with an emphasis on the quality. Just as not all in-person care is equal, not all telehealth is equal. Um, at Kaiser Permanente, we work to ensure that members and patients receive the right care at the right time at the right setting to meet their clinical needs and, and, um, and their care preferences. And sometimes that setting is their home or their workplace via a telehealth modality because it's, it is with their own doctor, oftentimes, who has their medical record available in front of them and has a history with that patient is more, and it's more convenient for the patient and timely and more, often more timely care. That patient can then get back to their day and their responsibilities after having their clinical issue taken care of. And that in Kaiser Permanente, you know, to Dr. Burston's point and to, to Murray's point earlier, it is part of, it's woven together with the rest of their care. Uh, that integration is, is part of how we deliver uh, telehealth. So that encounter is treated like other, any other where the physician's notes are made in the patient's medical record after the video visit or phone visit. Prescriptions are sent to the pharmacy, uh, lab and imaging orders are entered, and as needed, follow-up or specialist care appointments are made. At the same time, it's very possible that a telehealth encounter is not what's needed. So as part of our clinical and operational workflows, we ensure that patients can get the next available in-clinic appointment with their doctor uh, or, or their other provider, uh, another member of the care, care team, as is, that's appropriate. Um, so we believe that within our integrated delivery system, this works very well, and we'll hear more about how that works um, w when Dr. Trong uh, speaks later. Um, and we know that our members and our patients want access to care through these modalities. And so, um, as a member of our government relations team, I spend a lot of time developing um, our talking points and advocacy points around how we expand telehealth. Um, and we have you know, a number of barriers that we're working on addressing. Um, to Dr. Burston's you know, major points, reimbursement is a key barrier to the general expansion of telehealth. As we are, and, and the primary barrier, as I think Dr. Miller will, Miller will get into, is, around, is in Medicare. Um, and we have a situation where only a very, very small minority of, of patients across the country, Medicare beneficiaries, can get access um, to telehealth. So in the Medicare Advantage space, we spend a lot of time advocating <clears throat> around the value for the, for the Medicare beneficiaries. We do see our Medicare-aged uh, members and our Medicare eligibles wanting to access care via telehealth. And so we spend a, a great deal of time thinking about how can we how can we really demonstrate the value for Medicare members in the Medicare Advantage space? Uh, we've had more than one meeting with Dr. Miller and, and, st and staff at his time at, uh, during his time at MedPAC. Um, we also have expressed support for legislation that's moving through Congress now um, that is intended to alleviate some of the challenges around Medicare Advantage coverage uh, that would pr allow for Medicare Advantage plans to include telehealth as part of their basic Parts A and B bid. 
But Medicare is not the only area where we advocate. We certainly, um, we certainly are attuned to what is happening at the state level, and we do see more and more expansion and opportunities for plans, health plans, to uh, cover and pay for telehealth. Um, so the, the doors are being opened, but again, we do have these sort of these reimbursement barriers and other um, key issues that we need to d address in order to tip the scale for where um, where plans and where employers will want more and more telehealth um, and want to be able to access. I think the uh, the idea that when there's a critical mass of patients uh, demanding access, just like we do in the in the banking context, in every other context in transportation, we will see um, we'll see greater um, greater investment there. <clears throat> So the other areas where we are participating in, in some of policy discussions are at the state level around licensure, and so we are um, we're supporting the interstate compact license, or excuse me um, legislation uh, from the Federation of State Medical Boards. Um, that is an area where we're pushing um, our state regulators and legislators to act. We're also working with the state of California um, on their issue, their um, their excuse me. Um, their effort to extend um, e-consults, where the provider-to-provider -provider engagement is allowed and, and more um, more uh, open to for specialists to be able to engage with primary care providers, potentially in vul more vulnerable areas of the state. Um, and so, while we, as a Kaiser Permanente, do a lot, a f fair amount of e-consults internally already, we um, we are working with the state to help them educate. Um, DHCS and others, um, Department of Healthcare Services, so that that can be extended to others. So with that as an introduction, I'd like to introduce our panel, um, who, will, who will grace us with uh, a few minutes of introduction, and then we'll be able to get into questions. So first we have Donna Kinzer, who is the Executive Director of the Maryland Health Services Cost Review Commission, where she has led her staff and the field through transitioning Maryland hospitals to global budgets. They adapt Maryland's quality improvement programs to the new model, develop new payment policies, analyze potential avoidable uh, utilization for hospitals, and implement broad stakeholder input approaches. Next, we have Brian Marcotte, who is the president and CEO of the National Business Group on Health, the nation's only nonprofit organization devoted exclusively to representing large employers' perspectives on national health policy issues and helping companies optimize business performance through health improvement and healthcare management. Next is Dr. Mark Miller. Um, he, he is the recently appointed Vice President of Healthcare at the Laura and John Arnold Foundation. Prior to joining the foundation, Mark served for 15 years as the Executive Director of MedPAC, the Maryland, pa Maryland excuse me, the Medicare Payment <laughs> Advisory Commission, which as we know is the independent congressional agency established to advise Congress on issues affecting the Medicare program. Mark also previously served as Assistant Director of the Health and Human Resources uh, at the Congressional Budget Office and as Deputy Director Director of Health Plans at CMS. And finally, Dr. Sandra Wilkness, who is the Program Director for the NGA Center for uh, Best Practices Health Division, focusing on issues related to behavioral health and social determinants of health and the innovative integration of these into the health system transformation efforts. She leads NGA's technical assistance work with states to advance programs for high need, high cost populations. So I'd like to uh, welcome our panel. And I think we'll begin with uh, Donna Kisner. Kinzer, pardon me. Good morning. Um, thank you very much to Kaiser Permanente and the Kaiser Foundation for uh, inviting uh, uh, me here today to talk about what we're a little bit about what we're doing in Maryland and to reflect on the uh, wonderful remarks from Dr. Burston, um, very provocative questions, and um, to share some of the initial uh, uh, observations and efforts that we're uh, uh, taking on in uh, telehealth in Maryland. And uh, I have one slide, and um, I have one disclosure. My disclosure is I'm the executive director of the Health Services Cost Review Commission, and we're uh, implementing uh, a, uh, a payment and delivery model transformation. And so, of course, um, that uh, uh, colors my view of, uh, of the world. And, uh, and 
uh, I uh, appreciate the opportunity to tell you about briefly about what you're doing and then to delve into some of uh, Dr. Burstyn's uh, provocative questions. So um, I just wanted to give you a little background on what we're doing. I have only one slide, um, so I'm not going to spend a lot of time uh, uh, in, in the, uh, in the uh, slide mode. But uh, I think it's important to just set a context to understand uh, what I think is uh, th that everybody keeps bringing up is the reimbursement challenge and um, how we're, uh, we're tackling that, but uh, also some of the uh, elements of that that make it uh, more uh, difficult to tackle than we might imagine on the surface. Um, the, in Maryland, uh, the reimbursement system is moving away from a volume-based model. And uh, since 2014, hospitals in Maryland have been paid on a budget that is set at the beginning of the year. Our system is uh, driven off of a per capita uh, approach with uh, value-based payment. And the system covers uh, all six million Marylanders. Uh, the budgets cover hospital payments for all payers. And, um, and this is being brought uh, forward through provider-led efforts. Our, this is not a big government project. Um, we have a, uh, uh, we're uh, implementing this with our commission, which is seven voluntary commissioners and 37 staff. So obviously, we're not implementing, um, implementing the uh, transformation that is taking place. It's the provider community that is implementing. And we're doing this um, under a federal demonstration that allows uh, Maryland to set hospital payment levels for all payers. And Maryland has been setting hospital rates for all payers since 1977 under federal waivers. But in this situation, we moved away from a rate setting concept really to a per capita concept in 2014. And um, just to uh, give you a little uh, view of, of what we've been experiencing, um, we have been experiencing savings to the Medicare program without cost shifting. And we've uh, uh, had uh, some very significant um, uh, reductions in avoidable utilization. We've been able to stabilize rural hospitals in Maryland through this model, and I'll talk a little bit more about that, which, of course, is a big national concern. Uh, in, when we started this program, we were among the, and uh, I can't say this uh, proudly, but we were, were among the highest states in readmission levels. Uh, for the Medicare program, and we have now reduced down to the national average, even though we have many social uh, problems, particularly in our urban areas. And, um, and, and so we have, uh, we've been doing this since 2014, and we're currently in the process of designing a program to take us forward that will go beyond hospitals. And we see a little uh, uh, circle, a set of bubbles uh, in the uh, slide. And, and so now we're operating the hospital per capita program with some care redesign programs that are provider initiated. Um, as we go into 2019 and beyond, we will be on a per capita program for total Part A and Part B cost for about 800,000 Medicare beneficiaries in the state. Um, this is the, the program that we're uh, working on and designing now. And as part of that, we will uh, launch a primary care program, part of uh, uh, which will uh, allow um, uh, telehealth uh, uh, and other non-face-to-face -face, uh, visit activities. Uh, and um, we will also be focused on driving population health efforts that are aligned with the model, particularly uh, opioid and diabetes are uh, the uh, first two that are of, uh, of top interest to, uh, to uh, Maryland as we move forward. Um, and we're trying to do this in, uh, we, we don't have the uh, 
fully integrated delivery system, and we actually are trying to do this in a virtually integrated delivery system where we use alignment approaches to align providers across the delivery system. And, and so as a result of that, we're expecting to have improved uh, complex and, and, and chronic care and um, population health, as well as increased alignment across the system. So that's just really a brief view, just to, just to try to set the stage of, of uh, what we're trying to accomplish in Maryland. And, and so I just wanted to talk a little bit about some of the, um, some of the things that uh, hospitals, since they are the first participants, have been trying to cope with and to, uh, to do in the new system, particularly with, uh, with telehealth support. Um, and um, as you think about this from a hospital perspective on a per capita budget, so the hospital's questions are, um, how do we afford the new treatments and the new technology? And how can we free up some money to help us address this, uh, some of the population health and social determinants of, uh, of care and care management needs? And so, um, so that's been what hospitals have been working on. Um, in the first, uh, in this first uh, four years of the Maryland model. And in that, they've been focusing on reducing unnecessary emergency room visits and avoidable admissions so that they can free up money to um, uh, afford uh, uh, care management and, um, and, and new treatments. And, um, and, and so some of this is leading to work with um, emergency room uh, providers and nursing homes. So I'll get into that in a, in a minute. And also the growing mental health crisis is an area where Maryland is relying on telehealth to uh, move forward its, uh, its efforts. And, um, and, and f finally, I think as we move, as, as I mentioned before, as we move into the second phase, Maryland will be bringing telemedicine into the primary care environment. And the rural health environment is the final area where we're uh, seeing an increase in the telemedicine activities, combining rotating physicians into rural communities with telemedicine and um, trying to bring more care back into the rural communities as opposed to necessarily take more rural patients into urban settings. So I just want to step back a, a few minutes and tell you a little bit about some of the emergency uh, applications and some initial observations and some continuing problems and challenges that uh, that we're going to be tackling on an ongoing basis. Um, we uh, have been working in the emergency, uh, the MEMS, our emergency medical system transport, that transports patients to the emergency room, has been uh, working to, uh, in some demonstrations, to uh, determine what percentage of patients need to go to a hospital emergency room versus who could actually be treated in the home or in an alternative uh, urgent care type of setting or the next day at the doctor's office. And we have, um, we have uh, seven demonstrations underway with this, and the, uh, the statistics that have come back from this so far are that more than 60% of the patients don't need to go to an emergency room. So... Um, and and some, to some people, this is not new news. Um, this is old news. But now we have a system where the providers are becoming aligned to want to make sure that the patients get the treatment in the right setting at the right place at the right time. Um, and um, some of the, uh, there are some challenges to this, though, even though we have hospitals who are now aligned in this methodology in terms of wanting to make sure that the patients are getting the treatment in the right place. 
the emergency medical system only gets paid if they transport the patient to the hospital. So this is a problem for the uh, emergency medical system. So we haven't solved that problem yet, but I think we're on the way. And, um, and so that's an example of, uh, of what we're doing and, um, and, and the challenges that we still face. And, um, um, the, and, and I just wanted to briefly talk about the nursing home uh, environment, and then I'll turn over to uh, our next uh, speaker. But um, our um, hospitals are connecting with uh, long-term care facilities to try to provide specialty consults to avoid unnecessary transport to the hospital and unnecessary admission. So those are a couple things that we're uh, tackling in Maryland and some of the problems that we're still experiencing with reimbursement. So thank you very much. And um, I'll uh, turn over to our next person. We can turn uh, it person. over to, to Brian. Good morning, everyone, and thank you for the opportunity to give you an employer perspective of telehealth. And uh, I first want to say I, too, am a Monty Python fan and uh, appreciate the reference. Uh, so what I'd like to do is give you, I would say, an outside-in look at telehealth. And uh, the business group is really made up of large, multi-state, in many cases global, self-funded employers. And I think... The, Multi-state's an important element here. Self-funded's an important element here. When you think about our membership, uh, which includes 74 of the Fortune 100, 57% of the Fortune 200, these are big multi-state jumbo employers who are trying to address the needs of their employees on a nationwide basis. So that's the perspective that I'll come at this. And I want to start with two observations. The first is when it comes, when it comes to innovation within healthcare, from an employer perspective, there is a significant lag between adoption, availability, and acceptance. Second observation is large employers are not willing to wait for the delivery system to catch up if they see a need that they find a solution that will address that need. And there are lots of examples of this. You look at centers of excellence, great example, um, condition management programs, medical decision support, and I would say even the emerging concierge services, all of those are resources that employers have bolted on to this healthcare delivery system in an attempt to help employees navigate a very fragmented system, help them identify and understand their treatment options, and help steer them to the best place for care. And I would say telehealth fits into this category of, a, of an innovation that is available but not widely adopted or accepted to this point, and one that employers have not been willing to wait for implementation. And while I totally agree that the most effective way of delivering telehealth or the best scenario would be as an extension of a primary, uh, primary care's office, patient-centered medical home, of a care team in a local market that's my provider, the reality is that happens in some integrated delivery models, but it's very inconsistent in terms of how it's and you know this, distributed across the country. And for a large multi-state employer, therein lies the challenge. If you go back five years ago, 7% of big companies offered telehealth as an option to their employees. And those were the early trailblazers. They contact, contracted directly with the Teladocs, the American Wells, the, um, uh, the other players in that space. In 2018, 96% of large companies will offer telehealth to their employees, and 56% of them will offer telebehavioral health to their employees, which is a 50% increase over this year in terms of how that's expanding. And employers are doing this despite the challenges and the inconsistencies from a state-by-state -state legisla legislative and regulatory structure that is very inconsistent. Um, and they're doing this despite in the knowledge that these telehealth options aren't very well integrated with the delivery system. But they see the value. They see the value in the convenience, in the access, in the efficiency of telehealth as a solution to help employees 
be more productive, more efficient, save them money, save them time, save on PTO. And I'm going to give you some examples of what some companies have done as, as, we, uh, as we get into this. But let's talk about consumers and consumers from an employer perspective as well. I'm going to give you some data from a few studies. There's been growing acceptance, and that's been also said, from consumers with telehealth as an alternative access pathway to, to health care. In a 2017 Aon National Business Group on Health Consumer Mindset Survey, 57% of the consumers stated they would be willing to consider telehealth as a new way to get better outcomes. Nearly 40% of millennials would likely use telebehavioral health services if offered by their employer. A survey conducted by the Harris Poll a year ago found that of consumers with a PCP, 65% were very or somewhat interested in video appointments. And if their PCP did not offer video visits, 20% of the respondents said they would be willing to switch to a new provider who offered telehealth visits. When you look at millennials, that number jumped to about 35%. When you looked at parents with underage children, it also jumped to 35 to 40% range. So there's considerable interest from consumers that's growing. Even in our own survey, we do a plan design healthcare strategy survey everywhere with our, every year with our members. And we're be beginning to see greater adoption and, and acceptance of telehealth. 20% of our members state that they're seeing 8% or greater utilization with telehealth now. And I want to give you three case studies or three examples of, of employers who have driven significant utilization with telehealth. The first is a company that has a s significant number of drivers, multi-state employer, all 50 states, driving, drivers are a big part of their business. They've been able to achieve a 14% telehealth utilization, and they've done this and you have to re remember here, employers have a captive audience. So they have certain levers that you may not have in the market, in, in the ecosystem. Uh, they have plan design levers, they have communication levers, and they have levers to use their managers as a support system. So by offering free visits, uh, an aggressive communication campaign, and leveraging their concierge services, which was Accolade, as a referral process too, and to allow their drivers who use iPads for working um, to do telehealth visits. They've been able to achieve that 14%, help save on PTO time for drivers, and help drive productivity as well. And as employers think about the impact of telehealth, it's not just about healthcare and healthcare cost and the convenience and the access. It's also about productivity, the effectiveness of the workforce, the availability of the workforce as well. Another company achieved 30% telehealth utilization, again by offering free visits, auto-enrollment into telehealth, and leveraging their managers to help support, talk to, and, and refer people, if necessary, to, to telehealth as a resource. And then a third company achieved 46% utilization with telehealth, in part because of its demographics, which three-quarters were millennials, and they were hub, their, their locations were San Francisco and New York primarily, and they leveraged their on-site health centers to do telehealth through those, as well as referring people to telehealth, offering offer, also offering free visits, and also having a population that's 50%, 57% women in, in, their, in their company. So three examples of companies that are getting good penetration with telehealth as an option. Most companies today offer telehealth through their health plan, most of these large multi-state employers. But there is a growing number of point solutions in the market that are offering solutions that include some type of virtual health component. At the business group, we have a health innovations forum where we bring 30 companies together in a Shark Tank-like environment, and we vet startups looking for innovation that, that can disrupt healthcare in a positive way and accelerate adoption of those solutions in the market. And I would say of the 50 or so startups we've looked at in the last three years, more than half had some type of digital or virtual health solution as either all of or part of what they were providing. And employers are beginning to bolt more of these on. Now, the good and bad of that is it further fragments delivery. The good of that is it's addressing particular needs in the market that are not being addressed consistently today. We're seeing telehealth or virtual health examples 
in lifestyle and condition management, in musculoskeletal and physical therapy, in behavioral health, in medical decision support, and second opinion services where you can have virtual consults. These are all emerging and growing, and employers are bolting these on and working actually with their health plans as an aggregator in some cases to, to manage and, and support these. You know, I would say that I'll, I'll kind of end where I began, and that is innovation in healthcare is slow to take ground within the healthcare ecosystem even though we're seeing real groundbreaking applications. I want to give you one provocative example and leave you with this before we move on to the next presenter. I don't know if you've heard of Babylon Health. It's a UK-based company, and it's on a mission to make primary care accessible to and affordable for every person in the world through an AI platform that can engage with a sick patient and accurately diagnose 80% of common conditions and to direct them to the appropriate site of care without human intervention. That's what they're, they're working with the National Health Services within the UK to pilot this right now, as well as working in, in a couple of other countries, and they're looking to also bring this capability to the US. Obviously, there's a lot of testing, a lot of evidence, there's a lot of work that has to be done, but the new frontier of virtual health is real. We're at the, we're, we are at the tip of the iceberg of what's capable, and you will see continued emergence of solutions that if we can't find a way to deliver them in the local delivery systems and integrate them in, we will disintermediate in some way the delivery systems and we'll still have to find a way to integrate in. But I think therein lies the risk, but there also in lies the opportunity. Thank you. Okay, um, a couple people have made disclosures which I didn't realize we were going to have to do, and so um, the only disclosure I think I have to make is that I started my career as an optimi uh, optimistic and uh, idealistic young man. I'm now sad and broken, and so we'll start there. The other thing is, is the art of being a reaction uh, person is, is like to link to the comments of the main speaker, but then end up saying the things you were going to say anyway, which I'm definitely going to try and do here. But actually, this is going to be relatively easy because Helen said a few things that um, I think are, are very relevant to my comments. So let me actually start there and try and do what the job was asked to do. The first thing that she said is that our <coughs> somewhere early on in her comments, she said, Evidence is mixed, and it's hard to translate where the evidence is coming from, particularly, as she may not have said this, but in my mind, to fee-for-service. Uh, the evidence is very mixed, and of course, in, the, in our environment, people are pushing very hard Medicare. I'm going to be speaking about Medicare here for the most part. Medicare needs to pay for all of this stuff, but the evidence exactly uh, is not really come together. And the thing that I keep observing, and this is not the same thing, and not just true of telehealth. This has been true throughout you know, my career is people come with evidence out of a managed care environment or a VA environment or some other kind of environment that's not like Wild West fee-for-service, and they say, do this, it will work. And the answer is, it will not work. It will be completely sidetracked when it gets into Wild West fee-for-service. And so there's always uh, that disconnect. And I think it's a very hard bridge uh, to, um, to, to get across. Um, <clears throat> however along those lines to try and be a little bit optimistic and again to kind of go back to something Helen uh, said is uh, she said you know we shouldn't assume that technology leads to improvement and she said also around the same time we should be thinking more about uh, bundled payments and I also have had this experience over the, the last few years and I would think about it this way, which is I have so many people in my past job approaching me saying, I have this technology, assign a code, assign a number to it, and pay for it. And I think that is precisely the wrong way to be thinking about innovation, whether it's telehealth or any other kind of innovation. And I get, I get my background and my experience and everything, and so I'm highly biased. It is not about that. It is about payment systems that can accommodate change. 
That's what we need to do because technology is going to change. The way you practice medicine is going to change. And to the extent you're doing it through piecemeal assignment of codes and payments, you're on the wrong track because most of that is going to be obsolete in many years anyway. And so why uh, proceed uh, that way? Uh, not related to my comments, but a really good one she made is, is that this needs to be built into the medical education process in some earlier work. I saw the same thing where people are just, what are you talking about? I had no experience with any of that, and so I don't know how to proceed once they get out uh, into the field. So I completely uh, agree with that. Okay, so then uh, to kind of, uh, so the two things I've said so far is, is that there are mixed results in the research and it's often coming out of environments that are hard to translate into fee-for-service. May be very helpful in Medicare's managed care programs or other uh, bundled payment environments, but uh, difficult to, to cross over into fee-for-service. And the notion that payment systems need to work more towards um, larger units of payments and leaving flexibility uh, for uh, providers. And Medicare is generally pointed to as the big problem with telehealth, and everything could move forward if Medicare would just get a clue and kind of get on with it. And lots of activity at the federal level in trying to integrate uh, telehealth into to the Medicare program. And so now I'm going to try and systematically address that comment. So um, one thing to keep in mind is a third of Medicare is in managed care plans, and managed care plans do have flexibility to use telehealth. Now, there are some technical arguments going back and forth, which I will be happy to get into in a lot of detail, but there are some technical comments going back and forth about how bidding works, or in other environments where I get approached by home health agencies who get 60-day episode payments, and they say arguments like this, telehealth, remote patient patient monitoring will save you a gazillion dollars. You should increase our rate. And I never follow that argument. They have a 60-day bundle. They say it saves them money, but they want Medicare to increase the payment in order to pay for the uh, uh, telehealth. That does not logically make sense. So my argument here is, is we should be moving to capitated managed care environments. When an accountable care organization takes two-sided risks, they should be relieved of the fee-for-service regulations and allow them to cut through and start using telehealth how they see it should be done. And in bundled payment environments, which I believe a lot of flexibility exists in the DRG and the home health environment, providers should be uh, moving to it. Now, where things fall apart and things become very complex is when you hit the fee for the true fee for service environment and in particular the physician uh, and uh, clinician environment where you're paying service uh, by service and things do become more difficult there um, and in assessing that you know you will whether you like it or not have to think about the cost and if moving to it is ultimately scored as a cost, that's going to uh, slow things down. But if the case can be made on improving access, and particularly access to needed services, or if the case can be made that outcomes will in in increase, then obviously the, the, um, the case uh, is more likely to go forward. Now, one thing I want to say, and Helen touched on this as well, is I also think from a policymaking point of view, you need to distinguish between access and convenience. I think of access as getting access to a needed service. Convenience is different. I have access to this service. Do I want it more conveniently or not? And you might, from a policy point of view, think of those two situations differently. And I can talk more about on question if anybody wants to, to get into that. So how should fee-for-service uh, approach this? Here's a few thoughts, and thinking about it, if you wanted to move forward in fee-for-service and in a principled way, and I'm trying to stay on time here. So one is, can you create white space in your fee-for-service payments? CMS is definitely trying to create codes that say, okay, if you're involved in uh, transitional care, there's a bit of a white space here, and you can engage in activities. Another idea is whether you move 
primary care payment off of a service by service reimbursement and try and give pay, uh, part of the payment that you give to a primary care provider on a per patient basis. So each of their services is not in fact driven by a service by service uh, interaction, but they have the flexibility to engage in more uh, telehealth uh, type of things. Another approach in order to uh, move ahead but not necessarily blow the lid off of a, the budget is to come in on a condition basis and say there may be certain conditions where at least the exposure for fee-for-service fee is small enough that the risk of going in and doing telehealth is not that great. So, for example, if somebody's doing home dialysis, you might say they can do their uh, visits with their uh, provider through telehealth. And the notion there is that's not going to blow the lid off of the program because people aren't trying to become uh, dialysis patients or Parkinson's patients or that type of thing. There are certain uh, interact or certain uh, telehealth that is starting to prove that even in a relatively uncontrolled environment, it may have an effect. I am watching closely the nursing home link to the emergency room. If that could be established, that might work. But of course, the better way to go would be to start paying on a, a bundled basis in that environment and then saying to the provider, if this makes sense, go ahead and uh, do it. And then the last thing I'll say, and I'm done, is, is I remember in the high-risk areas, there is always a CMMI, an innovation center um, strategy here. So the direct-to-consumer stuff where I touch my uh, tablet and I connect to my doctor, which could uh, have the potential in fee-for-service to be very expensive, could be tested through uh, uh, an innovation environment to see what the actual uh, induced demand effects are in, in an environment like that before it's let out into the uh, Wild West. And I will yield the last 19 seconds to the next. Okay. Hi. Good morning, and thank you to the Kaiser folks for the invitation today. I'm Sandra Wilkness from the National Governors Association, and I thought I was going to be very duplicative in my comments, but I, I feel fortunate that I can bring the, some more of the state perspective and perhaps the Medicaid lens a little bit around um, a, a, as a follow-up to what Mark just presented on the Medicare side. Um, I, it, just for folks who don't know, the National Governors Association is the bipartisan organization serving the nation's governors, where they come to sh exchange uh, best ideas about best practices, um, to innovations around improving state, uh, state government, and also speak collectively on, on national policy issues. I'm actually in the Center for Best Practices, which is the nonprofit side of NGA. And our job is, is sort of a hybrid think tank consultancy working with governors and their policy advisors. So my, my thoughts today are, are really from that perspective and lessons learned there. Um, so the, the, the Picture is a little bit different on the Medicaid side and some of the, the work we're doing with states. And probably the best thing for me to do is just highlight um, some specific project areas we're working on with states and where telehealth solutions are really rising to the surface as, as um, solutions that they're eager to engage in to figure out what is the best path forward and what is the state level solution to, to proliferate some of the, the best practices here. Um, we work, of course, in multiple areas across health and health system transformation, but I would say the area where telehealth uh, really comes up the most, of course, is in rural areas, public health, um, behavioral health, certainly the opioids crisis, telesolutions are really um, being sought there, and then also uh, um, in workforce issues. Um, so we have several cross-cutting projects. Um, one that I wanted to highlight so that I can kind of get into the details of what we're hearing about in terms of challenges from states to kind of to uh, respond to Helen's charge to talk about what some of these challenges are. Um, is in the rural health area. And I just wanted to note that our projects are, are based on a competitive process. States apply to, to work with us and for us to provide technical assistance. Um, and for this rural health project, um, states were told apply in whatever way you like, whatever you want to do in rural health. Is it data? You know, is it dealing with hospital closures? Whatever. Every single state that applied for this project said we need help in behavioral health. We need help in opioids. We have massive workforce shortages. We're just not sure what to do. So um, across the board, that 
seems to be one of the areas where there's a really a real strong need for some solutions and where telehealth is being highlighted specifically as a, an area where they want some support. Um, so we're working that project with seven states, and of course, it's all rural facing. Uh, so the issues I don't have to remind people are issues around transportation, rural hospital closures, massive workforce shortages, especially in behavioral health. Um, and the solutions that states are pursuing are, of course, around reimbursement. A lot of this is in the Medicaid space, but not exclusively. We, we heard a little bit about Project ECHO, and again, I thought I would be duplicative, but I'll talk a little bit about Project ECHO and how valuable it's been um, in the state space, but certainly a challenge for, uh, still from a reimbursement standpoint. I mean, they're trying to paste together all kinds of reimbursement approaches to get tele, tele, um, to Project ECHO-like projects up and running in states and to sustain those, those efforts. So so reimbursement is one. Um, it, the covered services, what's covered in terms of um, coverage parity and reimbursement parity, so those are some issues states are grappling with. Um, eligibility and sites of care, and maybe this is too in the weeds, but I did want to highlight it, um, that the distance uh, site and the originating site and actually offering those services and being able to reimburse and align with federal policies is a real challenge, especially using the National Health Service Corps, which a lot of rural areas are trying to engage in. There are all kinds of glitches in terms of actually how do you get reimbursed. You have to be in a health professional shortage area to actually offer the service to another health professional shortage area. So that's a massive challenge with respect to harnessing um, the, the, um, the, the, the uh, human resources that are needed in, in those areas. And then interstate licensure that was raised. And so I just wanted to touch on that a little bit and maybe provide a little more texture around what's happening there. Um, okay, so let me try to be brief because I don't have a whole lot of time. Um, in terms of reimbursement, uh, the picture as I understand it today is 15 states are reimbursing for store and forward kind of opportunities. 21 states are reimbursing for remote patient monitoring. Um, this is all through the Medicaid program where, as Mark noted, there's a lot more flexibility than in the Medicare program. And states are eagerly pursuing coverage parity and reimbursement parity in those settings. They're working with their plans to actually offer um, a lot more flexibility there as well. Um, I already mentioned the challenges with the National Health Service Corps, this distance, and I don't know if you all are familiar with this, but there's a lot of effort um, on, among these states to align not only what's happening in states, and it probably won't surprise you all to know, a lot of times there's not a lot of knowledge about what's happening in states across even state, other state agencies with respect to these kinds of services, but also what's happening on the ground with providers. There's, as, as, um, as Brian pointed out, there's a lot of innovation already happening on the ground and actually feeding that up and, and creating some awareness on the state level to figure out how do we align, how do we not work at cross purposes, and how do we use state levers to actually elevate what's working and figure out how to scale and spread it. There's still a lot of need there, a lot of support need there, and a lot of information to flow up to the state level would be really valuable. Um, interstate licensure. Uh, so this is a, a big issue and a, a, a big challenge for states as telehealth popularity is growing. The states are eager to figure out how we work across state lines. Uh, and there are a number of challenges here. Um, again, just for a little bit of context, currently there are 22 states that have adopted um, medical licensure compacts. So a lot of this is operating in the compact space. And for a lot of different providers, so physicians, nurses, advanced practice nurses, psychologists, uh, physical therapists, and others. Um, 17 states are currently issuing licenses, and 12 of those can serve as states of principal license, for those of you who know what that means. Um, and then five states have passed compact legislation, but have been delayed. And some of the challenges here um, from the state perspective are concerns around the autonomy of state regulatory boards um, and, other, and, and other professional boards. There are concerns about the additional costs cost to providers and others to engage in these compacts and to do cross-state licensure. Um, and then also uh, issues around FBI requirements for background checks. So there are a lot of, uh, a lot of federal and state and, and provider level issues that, are still, that states are still grappling with to make these compacts a reality and to move them forward. Uh, and then I just wanted to end by um, highlighting a couple of examples of uh, what seems to be working in states. And I wanted to also... Um, underscore that I think on the state policy level, there's a huge emphasis on on big data, right? There's a huge emphasis on data collection um, for a lot of purposes. One is for targeting resources. So, there, so states are actually trying to think very thoughtfully, think thoughtfully. They're being thoughtful about looking at their data to figure out how to target telehealth resources and others. And they're using you know, the business case like in uh, reduced uh, ED and hospital uses, utilization as a starting point. And then they're, they're evaluating what they're doing. So there's a lot more evaluation out 
out there on the state level than perhaps is making it into the, the routine literature, and I'm happy to talk with folks further about that. One good example of this is North Carolina Statewide Telepsychiatry Program. It's called NCSTEP for short, if folks are familiar with it. And then essentially what it is is a telepsychiatry program. Folks land in the emergency department with a behavioral health crisis. Um, there are, I think, 42 spoke sites, so it's a hub and spoke model, 42 spoke sites around the state, seven hub sites. Those hub sites then deploy psychiatric support or psychological support, whatever the need is, and through telepsychiatry work with the ED providers to determine what the needs are. Does, where does this patient, this individual need care? Um, do they need to be held somewhere? Do they need to actually go into the hospital? What is the issue? And they found um, some pretty s striking findings. Um, there, from a patient experience standpoint, there's a lot of improvement. Um, folks end up much uh, less frequently in the EDN inpatient, and they're, they're finding a $13.3 million savings annually for that program. So I think in terms of bending the cost curve, um, that is an example of where a state's being very selective in deploying resources and also trying to evaluate the outcome of that. And then finally, I just wanted to say, um, again, on the Project ECHO front, the, the teleconsultation model, that is one that is proliferating across states I don't, and internationally. I don't need to tell folks that, but it is, a, um, it is a very desirable model from the state perspective to really get more uh, support out to... to um, to rural areas in particular. Um, one example of this, and, and you guys are familiar probably with all the core Project ECHO models, but one more recent example is um, an ECHO model in Colorado that's around chronic pain disease management program. As I said before, opioids is always top of mind for governors, and um, this model's been running for about two years. And um, in May of 2016, they added a buprenorphine telehealth program. Uh, they haven't, we don't have any evaluation results from that yet, but this is a model that, that other states are really interested and eager to, to proliferate across the, across the country. Um, and I guess my final word on this is, uh, uh, from the state perspective, um, behavioral health, workforce shortages, and also, I mean, it was really interesting to hear about the, the training component. There's a very uh, strong interest in beefing up at least the Medicaid GME, which we know is dwarfed by the Medicare GME, but really trying to understand how better to use those resources to train um, in the new technology. So it'll be really interesting to see how that, how that continues. Thank you. Thank you. So we have another, another round of applause for all of our panelists. Thank you. That was fantastic, and it's a lot of food for thought. Uh, so now I'd like to invite Dr. Burston back up to the stage, and now we'll have an opportunity to ask questions from the audience. Um, I believe there are mics circulating. Do we have them on the tables? Oh, I think there are stand mics. So there's one by the tech table over to everyone's, oh, both sides, sorry both sides of the room. So if anyone has a question, feel free to stand at the mic. Um, while folks are queuing up, because I know you're all burning, uh, burning questions, um, wanted to, because we didn't have a chance to ask questions of Dr. Burston after her talk, um, just wanted to see if you have some reactions to the reactions um, and anything surprising that you might have heard at, uh, from, from our panelists. I didn't hear anything surprising. I, I think it all is consistent. It, it's, it's especially interesting, though, I think, for us to really understand the different perspectives, the state perspective, the federal perspective, and the employer perspective, and what they each bring to the big policy puzzle. And thinking about that holistically rather than in those narrow corridors, I think, is a real challenge for us. So perhaps, you know, from your policy perspective, a real opportunity. What's different? What's the same? And what could get moved forward? Given that the, um, our panelists did not have a chance to ask you questions, I want to encourage any, any questions of Dr. Burston from our panelists before the audience joins in, or any discussion that you'd like to engage from hearing each other. Uh, question, and this, um, a lot of the things I, um, as I said in my comments, I tried to directly uh, link to what Helen said and, and you know, had similar views. The thing that I hadn't thought about recently was the medical education angle, which I mentioned in passing and then um, uh, just immediately headed off. Um, 
uh, you know, several years ago, MedPAC made recommendations in the medical education space to try and delink payment to hospital, you know, the medical education payments on hospital admissions and to the hospital, uh, admissions to the hospital, and try and make the payment around more the graduate medical education, or the residency program, I'm sorry, the residency program itself, and then try and tie those payments to the aspects of the particular medical residency program. You know, does it uh, emphasize team-based care? Does it drive evidence-based medicine? And of course, at the time, you know, we could have also said, does it have components where you're using um, telehealth and that type of thing. And it was instead of having the payment in Medicare just driven by admissions to the um, uh, teaching hospital, have the teaching payments actually go be built around the residency program and look for particular cri uh, criteria in the residency program before the money is just dropped on the uh, doorstep of the hospital. One huge complaint being uh, among educators is that money is used to run the hospital. It's not used to educate or to change the, the residency program. So it's just something I had not thought about for a while. And so, uh, It's a really interesting piece of this puzzle. There's a lot of money that goes into that space. There are requirements of what are the, for, for GME, the ACGME clearly puts forward recommendations of what should be part of training programs. There's always been a component around technology. It's just never been very specific. And so in this new world, people have to understand how you interact in this way most responsibly to get the best possible outcome. So I think, I think it's a real opportunity. And I, I don't want to be, even though, you know, I now lead an organization of doctors. This is way bigger than doctors alone. This is really about health professions education broadly, whether it's nurses or pharmacists or anyone um, in that space who's going to be working in a very different environment that isn't always face-to-face. -face. I think this is on now. Yes. Uh, thank you. Um, I think we have a question from over here. Hi, yes, my name is Cleese Erickson. and I'm with George Washington's Health Workforce Research Center. And one of the things we've been looking at um, is the, the impact, and I've heard you all talk about, is the impact of telehealth on addressing maldistribution. But I wonder if you could comment and share any evidence that you've seen, whether you think it will reduce overall demand for um, physician services and other providers, or if it, uh, if it has any potential there, if you've seen any evidence of that to date. And I'll add, the reason I, I mention that is a lot of people, when they're talking about um, workforce shortages, um, point to telehealth as a way to ameliorate shortages. And that's, I think, more from the maldistribution side of things. But I wonder if there is any potential, if you see it, for reducing just general demand. Anyone want to jump in? Uh, I, I'd like to talk about the, uh, uh, maldistribution and uh, rural health, and um, I think the uh, the rural crisis of getting specialty care to rural areas is an area where telemedicine is um, starting to play a serious role in bringing more uh, uh, specialty care into rural areas. And so I think the um, the uh, uh, funding crisis in rural health of do we fund a full-time doctor who really doesn't have full-time volume and can't necessarily keep up with the changes in technology in, in a rural area. I do actually think that the supply um, and, and demand uh, will uh, be uh, helped along with uh, with telemedicine and, uh, and and rotations. And this is something that's only possible with electronic medical records, uh, rotations, and telemedicine. And it is being uh, beginning to be effectively deployed in. Uh, rural areas in Maryland, um, and I know in other parts of the country as well, but uh, definitely we're seeing uh, a, a deployment in Maryland, and that is reducing some of the losses that rural providers experience when they try to hire a full-time doctor to do a part-time volume of work. If I could just add on to that, I, I, I mean, I'm struggling because it's such a good question because it's, there's this tension between the convenience versus access set of issues that were raised by my co-panelists, but also there, there's such a desperate need in rural areas as, as I, I'm learning a lot through working with this project that it's all hands on deck. So I, I wonder if there's even a third component to this, and that is, do we think less traditionally about 
um, how these tele-support services actually might be deployed to people who need, um, unless it's super specialty services, need for, let's just take behavioral health, for example. There are a lot of things that can be done to improve people's outcomes that don't involve, you know, a PhD in psychology, and I can say that because I am one, but um, is, there are other solutions perhaps that can be um, augmented through teleoptions that don't necessarily involve the traditional workforce and, and just figuring out how to realign that maldistribution. Yeah, and I probably just don't have enough of imagination or, um, I mean, I, I definitely think of it as addressing the maldistribution. I definitely have, feel like sometimes people talk about it as overcoming shortages and I think sometimes if there's shortages if you have behavioral health problems you can tell health and it's not necessarily going to overcome those um, shortages it may help and it may help with some distribution but I haven't uh, had the thought of oh well this will actually reduce demand I'm more of the mind that at least some of the components of it are likely to increase demand depending on if I understood what you meant by that particular comment and maybe Sorry. just one last thought, and I agree, it's a really good question that I don't have a good answer to, other than I think we have to start thinking about our workforce analyses differently, right? If you can incorporate in the potential for distance learning or providers off-site, particularly the provider to the provider side, it may change our models of what we think workforce requirements are um, in a given area. So it, it, it's a really important question. Thank you for asking it. So I'll just add a, uh, a little bit of a different angle on this. I think the, we often hear of how overburdened physicians are and the opportunity to leverage, whether it's telehealth or retail clinics, if I look at what CVS and Aetna are looking to do with their integration, um, expanding different access points to primary care that could possibly free physicians up to take on more complicated, challenging issues. Um, so theoretically you can see where or conceptually you can see where that seems to make a lot of sense um, whether or not it's having that type of impact I don't know if I, I haven't seen any data on that thank you all uh, I think we have an, a next question from the audience Hi, good morning. I'm Andrea Shore with the School-Based Health Alliance. My question's for Sandra. Um, I am curious if any of the, we work with um, providers across the country who are either um, working in schools, directly in school-based health centers, or in community health centers who are collaborating with schools. And I'm curious if any of the projects that you're working with have pediatrics <clears throat> as either a large focus or um, something that you're providing some technical assistance on as it's growing in our Field is yeah, it's, and it's so important. Um, and unfortunately, the answer is no, not currently. A lot of the focus, as you might imagine, is really um, around where to make the business case. So we end up a lot uh, focusing a lot on the higher needs um, individuals, either on the adult end of the spectrum or if it's children, it's it's children born to mothers, you know, with addiction and, and those kinds of things seems to be where a lot of the acute need is and that uh, the innovations often start there and then spread to the broader system. Um, so we aren't currently, but I'm sure you're familiar with the McPack project, you know, right, with all of those kinds of pediatric interventions that could be used through teleconsultation, telesupport. Um, and I'd love to hear your thoughts about how we can support states more in that area. Thank you. Another question over here. Hi. Uh, I'm a technologist, so that's my uh, uh, disclosure. And I've been to many healthcare tech conferences over the past year and a half. And uh, almost all conversations ended up with the one word uh, reimbursement and fee-for-service. So it was very obvious very early on that value-based care is perhaps the biggest component. Uh, one observation that I wanted to share with you and um, have uh, people to comment on is I started looking at senior care uh, later uh, this fall, and I found that spe spe uh, specifically the architecture of the senior care campus where you have skilled and assisted living co-located with residential services, their tech adoption is a very interesting phenomenon. Uh, they're looking at uh, voice-activated technologies through Alexa, uh, which are they're trying to integrate that with uh, uh, EHRs on the, uh, at the back end. Uh, their openness to robotics, their openness to remote patient monitoring for wellness perhaps, and then also to, uh, for more clinical things. And the fact that you have a population where you 
you have the assisted, level, uh, the assisted care facilities or the uh, skilled nursing facilities where you're getting care and you just move off literally across the street into your own home and the remote patient monitoring can still track you uh, in, a, in a close proximity. So when I think about uh, the POCs that are happening in, uh, in other settings, it seems like this might be an interesting setting to kind of expand on and, and invest time and, uh, and effort in. So I just wanted to hear uh, if you had considered that setting. There are about 2,000 of these what they call now life plan communities with about uh, more than a half a million uh, you know, units, which is about, you know, I would say a, a million people today. But they're growing fast, and they have implications on home health care as well because a lot of these senior care facilities are now getting licenses to operate in the community, and they want to extend their services there. So I just wanted to hear if you've considered this. So uh, there's a couple of differentiations I, 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 w I would make. So and, and this whether this is right or, or wrong, this is a this is a fact. I mean, uh, there's a stage in uh, a, an elderly person's progression in which Medicare becomes much more involved. But the um, assisted living facility platform itself, and to the extent that it's a continuous care, non-acute nursing situation, Medicare actually doesn't play in that particular environment. Where Medicare uh, plays is home health, and home health is usually defined as a homebound situation. Although I would argue to the extent that the provider takes risk, that requirement could, uh, could and should um, uh, be relieved or Medicare plays when the person has an acute skilled nursing uh, visit, which may be a component of what you're talking about, but not necessarily the day-to-day -day maintenance of care. And to the extent that the person is, um, and actually people in those communities are not as likely to be Medicaid eligible would be my guess, mm -hmm. but the, the, the kind of maintenance level of nursing care really gets driven on the Medicaid side, and then you have these two large federal programs that are trying to interact with each other, and there's a whole history of difficulty in, in trying to coordinate, which I'd like to blame on Sandra. <laughs> she's sitting right here. Uh, but that, so the notion of, it, it is very logical to say, I'm looking at this population, we should be thinking, about it, and it's a perfectly reasonable uh, thing to do. But I think to the extent that that person in Medicare is more of a managed care environment or in an environment where their total cost of care is being managed like in an accountable care organization, ideas like that have a lot more traction. If that person is just kind of in Wild West fee-for-service, I think it becomes a bit more difficult to think about it in a comprehensive uh, way. And about two-thirds of the Medicare beneficiaries are still on the fee-for-service side. Sorry, I'll just add, I think there's an opportunity as we think about moving towards more and more of population-based payment, particularly for populations at risk, to just think very differently about what kind of outcomes you would assess and pay on. So you could easily see a, a model that's focused, for example, on the multiply chronically comorbidly ill elderly, in which payment can differentiate, regardless of how the services are provided, what are those long-term outcomes, what are the functional outcomes, what is the prevention of the high-ticket items like ED visits and hospitalizations, and then allow that innovation that, that you're providing to just be part of what you can negotiate with with those settings because they know at the end if they do well on those big functional outcomes or uh, utilization outcomes, they'll do well. Thank you. We have another question. Hi, I'm Rob Saunders from the Margolis Center for Health Policy at Duke. And one, I wanted to follow up actually on the, the sort of reimbursement payment question. So we do a, a lot of research looking at new payment models and trying to see what evidence is out there. And one of the struggles we see is that for many organizations, when they enter into an ACO or a bundle arrangement, we've removed a barrier that may have stopped them from, say, using telehealth, but that doesn't necessarily get them over the hump to, to trying something new because they may not know how to use the technology. They 
they, they may not even know where to start with buying the infrastructure, and there's a sort of operational guidance that they're still lacking uh, that sort of comes along with the payment model. The payment model raises awareness, but then you still need to do something in order to succeed under that payment model. And I, I wonder from the panel if, if there's been some thought from any of you on you know, how you sort of make that transition and supporting the health systems as they're trying these new value-based payment arrangements uh, while they uh, are trying to try out these new ideas in telehealth. You didn't say this, and you're still standing there, so you can defend yourself and all, all, all the rest of it. And you know you should. But and I will try and answer your question directly. But I just want to say one other thing bef before I do it. And you didn't say this. Just just to be clear, this is usually how the argument goes. You know, people come in and they say, you know, we under well often they don't want to accept the new payment system, but let's say they do. There is this new payment system, ACO. I'm willing to take risk, whatever the case may be. But now here's what I need: I have to make an initial investment. You need to pay for that. You have to train me to do it. You need to pay for, you know, explain, give me technical assistance. And then pretty soon, the cost benefit of, well, if this was going to yield some benefit, you know, to that provider under uh, a, either an ACO benchmark or a capitated, starts to disappear because the money has been, uh, you know, in this in investment or in this training. So I think the question you're asking is really fair and really difficult, but it also raises this question, where is Medicare's responsibility? Should it set the payment and say, you know, as many people are saying, the market will respond, providers will respond, and it's always, will they? And, and I think it's true, some of them will, and then some of them will have to be brought along, and, and how much investment should the government take on that and then if they take it on, does in fact on net this come out better for the taxpayer or worse for the taxpayer? And I think that's the uh, trade-off embedded in your question. And I always wonder why if the ROI is as strong as many people say it is, why aren't consultants and others entering this environment and going, you're going to save a gazillion dollars, you give me a little bit of those gazillion and I'll, ch you know, I'll help you get it off of the ground. But I think it triggers a key question, how does Medicare uh, or in whatever program, Medicaid, how much do you pay in bringing the person along? Now, I will say one last thing, and there, we did do some thinking about this. The way, back in my old job, the way the quality support payments occur, like in the QIO, QIO environment, we have some, or MedPAC had some very strong views about how to allocate that money more directly to providers to solve specific problems as opposed to the current mechanism that's used. It's more detail than this exchange, but it is a pot of money that could be repurposed for things like this. And I could talk to you offline about that if you're still interested in these comments. Maybe just one thing to add, and not so much on the reimbursement side, but I think we oftentimes talk about uh, a new technology, a new treatment, um, and we don't often spend as much time talking about how to implement it as we do uh, what we think it will be. And so there are examples of people who have implemented it, and you know, the, the, the U.S. unfortunately still tends to be these incredible islands of innovation and very little bridges across them. And so I think as a community, we really need to think about how we share those best practices, share those implementation lessons, whether it's with or without consultants. What have you done to get your clinicians engaged? What have you done, especially societies, to help um, bring your members along, to help them say, I want to bring this into my practice, what are the five things I need to prepare for in the next year to have that move forward? And I would just add something you already know, which may be less sexy, but, <laughs> you know, there's this whole dissemination, right, literature that you got to have your champion. It's got to come from the top. Accountability metrics that are transparent and public and shared where you can show your, you know, this provider is doing an excellent job in this domain that we're measuring. Someone else isn't and fostering that friendly competition, you know, those kinds of things, at least on you know, some of the state initiatives, um, seem to really uh, um, allow the delivery and payment strategies to actually take hold and, and, and be implemented. That's what we're observing. 
You know, I don't think you can look at telehealth in isolation. If you're an ACO and you're taking on risk, if to be in a position to take on risk, you need to have other competencies in place within your organization that all come together, whether it's around your care coordination model, whether it's your technology capability and ability to provide analytics to your providers, um, whether it's around your governance model and whether it's physician-driven or not. There's, there's a lot of different competencies that create a tipping point for a delivery system to be in a position to take on risk. And to look at telehealth in isolation, how do I implement on telehealth? All those other things have to be there if you're going to take risk anyways. And hopefully you can find a way to integrate it into that model. And from an employer perspective, we don't have a lot of sympathy for a delivery system that wants to be paid more to, take, and, and to implement some of these initiatives when there's so much waste in the system. And there's so much opportunity, if you're taking on two-sided risk, to win if you can execute. So I think that it's, it's part of the investment. Any, if a company is making an investment outside of healthcare to, to make their organization more efficient, to launch a new product, why can't we do that in healthcare as well? Why isn't the delivery system in a position to be able to make investments recognizing there will be a return if they drive the right efficiencies within their model. He said that better than me. <laughs> no, I, I, wanted to, <laughs> I, I wanted to comment as well. Um, in, in Maryland, our system started out before the 2014 um, experiment with 10 rural hospitals, and they formed a collaborative to... Uh, to uh, work on on this together, and um, it, to, to take a, a provider leadership in this, and also I think um, some of the providers in Maryland have stolen shamelessly from some of the Kaiser Permanente ideas. Um, so, for example, um, Kaiser using uh, uh, a, a lot of uh, a, a technology admits 80% of their patients directly without passing through an emergency room. And our, uh, some of our uh, primary care collaboratives have instituted that model and are using a, a series of technology and communications to, implement, uh, to uh, admit directly to the floors instead of through the ERs. And so this, these are, uh, uh, you know, copies shamelessly where you can find uh, better practices that can work and, and really uh, try to drive the provider uh, initiative. And... Um, um, and, and I do think it is difficult because a lot of the providers uh, do tend to say, well, uh, now you gave us this, now tell us how to do it. But then that's not really provider-led uh, innovation. So we really are looking to the providers to lead the innovation. And, um, and, and, and so that's uh, some of the experience that we've had in Maryland. Thank you all for responding. Uh, I think we have time for one more question. Thank you. Good morning. I'm Margo Edmonds from Academy Health, and I have a continuation question to what Rob started with the panel, and it's particularly for Helen and uh, Mark. And my question is about what are the policy levers to get more team-based care besides payment? And Helen, you alluded to the role of professional societies, and I think you're uniquely um, positioned to talk about that, but my concern is what we live through with meaningful use in EHRs and the informatics community and the real separation between clinical training and hands-on technical training. So what are some of the other levers that we can use besides just payment, particularly in the professional communities, to train people not only to feel comfortable with the technology, the clinicians and the highly credentialed cred uh, clinicians, but also to train in teams where there's more lateral decision-making that's shared, which is a real culture change? That's a great question, uh, Marco, um, who I had the pleasure of spending the day with yesterday on the Academy Health Board. Um, I think there are some real opportunities that go beyond reimbursement. I think some of this gets back to the sense that there's not much joy in practice at the moment. And so can you think about team-based models where uh, really being able to rely on each other and use people's skills to their fullest potentially allow for more um, 
effective interactions, a more collegial environment, not this is your job versus my job, but you know, some of the things we've talked about for so many years in primary care and PCMHs and others, of, you know, are you sitting next to your medical assistant? Are you getting their input in a different kind of way? Um, and I think the question will be, and I'd love to hear Mark's perspective and others on this, you know, currently we're still stuck in this environment where physician payment is physician payment, and a lot of it is specifically related to the individual work of that physician. So, you know, I get paid depending on the rates of my screening tests that I provide in an office setting. Again, it's that individual physician level performance. I think as the system moves away, hopefully, from individual physician level payment, it begins to think across more bundles and uh, system level payment. I think it allows more of that flexibility, but then I think it gets back to the, med to the training piece as well. I think we need to do a much better job of training health professionals together to fully respect and understand what we each bring to the table. We out of time yet? Uh, you, have another, you have another minute, Mark. Actually, kind of a hard question for me. Um, but what I would would say is, like, I, you said other than payment, but, you know, you heard my talk, you heard everything I said since then, you know, it's like, that's going to matter a lot, okay? I also think, and Helen and I have had uh, some of these conversations, and I can't remember how close she is to me on this, and she may not be, and reasonable people can disagree. I also think to the extent that we move our quality measurement out of like micro process, I did this, my aspen after heart attack, therefore I'm done, that, that type of thing, and more to population-based measures and say, I'm looking for the patient not to go to the emergency room, I'm looking for the patient not to go to the hospital, I'm looking for the patient not to die, those types of things. And then be more agnostic about how systems of providers get to that goal, which may force more collaboration and discussion across boundaries, is something that the Medicare program could do. Because I, I see this constant tension of trying to set a roadmap through dollars and measurement but not going below that and micromanage underneath neath it. And yet, from the, the provider community, you get very mixed signals. It's like, don't tell me what to do, but measure everything I do and move the money on that basis. And by the way, you didn't do it accurately, and I don't agree with those measures. And it's like how, from a policy perspective, and I'm being somewhat glib, maybe even a lot of glib, um, but you know, how from a policy perspective, you know, a big government, you know, nearly $700 billion program, do you square those signals? And my view is you get up to the top, you try and make payments across providers and try and measure across providers and then leave flexibility to the providers to figure it out, their professionalism, that type of thing. And then I will say again, I know I said it now the third time, I do think education at the front end when people matters a lot. Yeah. We're not just on the payment side. And I will say there are two things. Again, behavior, I'm coming from the behavioral health world and speaking you know, with my provider hat on, former provider, and talking with providers. And I would say there are two things that often drive it. And one is um, need for relief, desperate need for relief, and exposure. So um, the, the need for relief, meaning we don't know what our path forward is, and if we don't figure out how to get all hands on deck to solve this problem, really often drives multidisciplinary solutions and therefore is an impetus for um, a, a legitimate team-based approach. And what is the answer to that on a policy level? I don't know, but let's study it and figure out, you know, what can states and federal government do to support more of that. And then I would say the exposure piece is based on a visit I had to Montefiore um, where we talked with pediatricians who said it wasn't until we got the behavioral health people in the room where we actually started to ask people if they had any mental health concerns, right? Because we finally knew we could give it to someone else. We were afraid to ask because we couldn't solve the problem. Now that we have exposure and we know we can trust these people to help solve the problem, we're starting to do it. And I, I would say those two things are really driving it in a non-payment way. And unfortunately, that needs to be our last word. We are at the at time, um, and so I'd like to thank our panelists. It's been wonderful. Thank you all so much for uh, starting off our day with such a tremendous discussion.